Discovery clears the tower. Discovery, go and throttle up. Hello and welcome to the NASA's Johnson Space Center. It's been an exciting night. After 20 years of continuous human presence, the International Space Station is still marking new milestones and as of tonight has its first long-term crew of seven members. So we have a lot to celebrate tonight and here to talk it over with us, we have Associate Administrator of Human Exploration and Operations, Kathy Leaders, Johnson Space Center, uh, Johnson Space Center Director, Mark Geyer, and uh, socially distanced down the hall, Deputy Commercial Crew Program Manager, Vin Fang, and International Space Station Manager, Joel Montalbano. We'll let them each give a few mo opening remarks and then open it up to questions. For media on the line, press star one to let us know you have a question or star two if your question gets answered before you ask it. Let's kick it off with Kathy. Yeah, what a what an amazing last couple of days. I just can't tell you how. Um, Wonderful it was to see the crew come through the hatch. And uh, we've been talking a lot about all the firsts, right? This, this mission was a dream. It was a dream of us to be able to one day be able to have crew transportation services to the International Space Station. And today, that dream became a reality. Huge step for us, right? And it took a huge team of folks not only SpaceX folks, but NASA folks and our federal agency friends and, and a whole, uh, the DOD, uh, a ton of people made this happen today. Um, just a, an amazing feat, was not easy, this was hard. And then on top of it, one of the other firsts we had was we all had to do this in the time of a pandemic. <laughs> Um, I think there were some of us six or seven months ago that if you would have thought about all the things that this team's had to go through, um, they would have just said, oh, this is too much, but it wasn't. This team has done a phenomenal job. The crew on orbit is going to do phenomenal things over this next six months, and we're going to keep doing crew missions, and it's the start of a new era. I'm very, very proud of the NASA, SpaceX, the agency teams, and our nation for stepping out and doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. We'll go next to Mark Geyer. Great, thank you, Kathy. And I wanna thank you for your leadership, especially in making this happen. It is a terrific day for NASA um, uh, and for the country in general. It's really exciting to see the, the seven crew members on ISS, uh, four Americans, two Russians, and, and our Japanese uh, partners. Um, it's great to be starting this crew rotation plan and now being able to utilize ISS as we envisioned. And I'm honored to wear the increment 64 pin today, so it's a great start to that mission. The astronauts are doing great. Uh, you saw them as they came through the hatch. They're excited to start their mission. They're well, very well trained. Um, and they're ready to get started. You know, so we think, we believe that NASA um, unites with our partners, we evaluate the design. Sometimes we are the operators, sometimes we integrate the operations. Uh, all of these are ways where we are f melding our skills, uh, achieving NASA's missions, but also creating uh, commercial capabilities in this country that is a big part of our job. And of course, we're taking those skills uh, and actually pushing out in the lunar region with Gateway and, and supporting lunar lander systems as well. So a great, uh, a great uh, ending to the year, terrific to see the crews on ISS. Um, and so we look forward to all the work they're gonna achieve this increment. Thank you, Mark. Let's go next to Joel Montalbano. Well, welcome again to the uh, post-docking press brief. What an incredible achievement. And to have it happen in the month where we're celebrating 20 years of continuous human presence on board the International Space Station just puts a smile on my face. You know, today or yesterday we saw a picture-perfect launch and today a very smooth docking. And with that, we welcome the Dragon vehicle and her crew to the International Space Station. 
We look forward to a significant amount of time on orbit. A significant number of months will be able to increase the amount of science, the amount of research, the amount of technology development we can do with the additional crew members. A huge thanks to the commercial crew program. A huge thanks and congratulations to the SpaceX team. You know, I promise the International Space Station program will take good care of the Dragon vehicle and our crew. So back over to you, Brandy. Thank you so much, Joel. And finally, we'll go to Vin, to Vin Fang. Thank you very much. It's an extremely exciting time to be in the space business right now. You know, as the resilience crew just said uh, right after hatch opening, they can't wait to get started. Well, we've had uh, teams of NASA and SpaceX and other agencies uh, involved uh, to, uh, in many ways, through, as Kathy mentioned, their blood, sweat, and tears over the years. This sort of culminates in the hatch opening and the crew joining the ISS for a six-month stay on board at the space station. So we're so proud of the teams. Uh, the arrival of resilience uh, marks the beginning, as, as, as was mentioned before, of, of another first-time event. This time the government commercial um, uh, crew rotation mission to the ISS. And looking back at another first that happened almost exactly 10 years ago uh, with the same team members involved, NASA and SpaceX uh, shared a similar accomplishment with the launch to a low Earth orbit of the Koch Demo Flight Number 1 mission in early December of 2010. That flight demonstrated the capabilities of Falcon and Dragon and the partnership, and since then have had 20 successful uh, cargo flights to the ISS, which have now led in just the last six months to these two crew missions, DM2 in May, and then the Crew-1 um, arrival just today. And as uh, Joel mentioned, uh, we're proud to be part of the ISS 20-year anniversary, uh, which is this month uh, with that Expedition 1 crew arrival. Uh, we're proud to follow in the footsteps of all the other 63 uh, expeditions that came before this one and glad to join for Expedition 64. So a uh, huge shout out to the NASA and SpaceX teams. Uh, excellent job, many hard years of work, and we're looking to, forward to making this a very successful first operational mission and many more to follow. Thank you. Great words to start us out there. We do just have a few um, reporters on the line, so uh, if you have a question, you can press star one, star two if your question gets answered before you ask it. Um, and as we call on you, if you could uh, direct your question to who you would like to answer it. Let's start with Reuters. Doing this and congrats on a successful um, flight. Uh, I guess this question could be for uh, anybody who, who wants to answer, I was wondering if there's any kind of um, like bidding or, or quarrels over who gets to sleep in Crew Dragon, and I was wondering what kind of value uh, will having someone sleep in Crew Dragon provide to SpaceX and NASA? Are you guys getting any data out of that, or what kind of tests are you are you going to perform with that? Thanks. Yeah, I think our plan is to have um, half Hopper uh, sleep in the Dragon. Uh, it's been checked out uh, operationally, uh, ventilation, uh, caution and warning, and so forth. So I think it's going to be an excellent opportunity to use that uh, and test it out as a um, as a habitable module. And uh, so that's that's our current plan, and we look forward to learning a lot. And we think it's going to be very comfortable, modern accommodations for them. Several of us would like to be sleeping in there tonight. Next, we'll go to Business Insider. Hi, thanks for doing this, and congrats, everybody. Um, this question is for Kathy. You've got a long mission ahead. What are you most looking forward to, and what's going to keep you up at night, if anything, over the next six months? Thanks. Well, you know, Joel's got a whole list of, of items that he wants to, these crew members to start working on. I mean, he's been a little bit starved of crew members, and he's got a backlog of, of work and science that he needs them to go get done. Um, you know, when you have people on board, you always are maintaining vigilance and making sure, just like we do with station, this, this having Dragon up there just means we have more people on orbit that we always are thinking of and making sure that we're taking care of them. Um, it's what makes human space flights so fun is and challenging is that, that you always have to realize that you're maintaining human safety in a tough environment. So, um, but we have a great station program, like Joel said, they will take care of the crew members and um, they make they make my ability to sleep a little bit better at night. So I'm counting on you, Joel. OK, 
Okay, our next question is going to come from Nashville News. My question is for Kathy. As you described at the beginning of this press conference, you know, it was tough to get to this point. Uh, what do you feel is the biggest risk when docking to the International Space Station? Thank you. Well, what makes it really nice is the spacecraft uh, makes it look easy, right? Um, but, but to get there isn't easy. It took a lot of joint work between the SpaceX and NASA teams to share their learning and to go through a lot of interchange, technical interchange, and a ton of testing to make it look like that. And um, it was a real testament today that we could all sit there and kind of be talking while it was going on and not biting our nails. And so um, I think uh, it's actually a, that the Dragon's a beautiful vehicle, and she did a nice job today. Definitely. Next up, we've got uh, space.com. Thank you all for doing this. Um, and yeah, congratulations. Um, this is probably for Joel. Could you just talk a little bit about what it means to have that like extra crew member on board, that like seventh astronaut? What does that mean for the research potential of this next six months spent coming up and, and like maybe beyond as, as we see this happen more often? Thank you. So one of the cool things about having the commercial crew program is we're able to double the amount of crew-tended science and research and technology development we do on board the International Space Station. So with three crew members, we were averaging about 35 hours a week of crew-tended science and research. With the fourth crew member, that person's time, the equivalent time is dedicated to science and utilization and research, so 70 hours. So we'll have 70, be able to do 70 hours with the four crew members. So with that, it kind of sets the standard for us for these next you know, years as we continue to develop the International Space Station, continue to use it, and allow us to do not only the science and research we have, but technology demonstration that will help us with the Artemis program. Okay, and I think we have a follow-up next from Business Insider. Uh, we do have uh, time for just a couple of follow-ups, so if you do have another question, you can press star one again, but we'll try and keep it short because I know these guys have been up for a while. Business Insider next. Hi, yeah, thanks for taking another question from me. Um, I guess this question is also for Kathy uh, or for anybody else who feels they can answer it. Um, just wanted to follow up on something that did come up in the last 27 hours, that propellant line heater and the thermal control system issues. Um, were those issues fully resolved? And if you could talk about what happened there, is there any reason this popped up in orbit but not on the ground? I'm also curious about any other issues you're tracking or if there's anything so far from this flight that needs further investigation. Thank you. So, Van, why don't you take this one? Because you've been in the – in our uh, – launch complex area and the mission control area following along sure. pretty diligently. So these are your team's issues. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, so the vehicle uh, is, is actually remarkably clean. So um, uh, after clearing a couple of alarms a little bit after launch uh, yesterday, um, the, the vehicle arrived um, at the station today uh, with full redundancy, full functionality, uh, no issues whatsoever. Um, earlier on, yes, there was a discussion about the, uh, the prop line heaters. They, they, did, um, they did trip off. Uh, uh, basically, it was based on fitter or fault detection limits that were set very tightly uh, on the ground. So, so SpaceX was very quick to identify the, uh, the cause of it, uh, meaning it was, it was a barely out of spec, uh, barely out of fitter limit that tripped it off for safety reasons. They identified it, uh, I'd say, within an hour. They had a fix proposed. Within two hours, they had a solution that was ready to be checked by the joint NASA and SpaceX team, and just shortly after that, they uplinked it, and everything was fine afterwards. Um, the, the route, uh, the, the problem uh, that they were protecting against was to make sure that the propellant line stayed within their thermal limits, uh, just to make sure that there's full functionality of the prop. Um, in the end, it turned out that uh, that, that limit was uh, tighter than it needed to be, so it was quickly fixed, and um, uh, Dragon's, Dragon's in beautiful shape. Okay, looks like we also have a follow-up question from Reuters. Hey, thank you. Um, just a follow-up on that for uh, Ven. 
Um, other than the prop line heaters, uh, th other than that issue, was there anything else that you guys detected during flight or during the docking sequence that kind of looked um, off or, or that, you know, something that was unexpected that you didn't see in, in prior tests? Thanks. Was, um, there was only one other thing of note uh, that we tracked, and again, it was also shortly after launch. Uh, it had to do with the thermal control system. There's a loop A and a loop B, and uh, on each of those loops, um, there are uh, segments uh, of the thermal loop that are isolated from other segments. And so based on uh, differentials um, with the, the temperature essentially, when you've got uh, th certain parts of the loop that uh, are exposed to different temperatures and they're equalized when they're on the ground at the same temperature and they, may be ex they were exposed to some different temperatures and loads during this early phase of flight. So once the isolation uh, between those two parts of the loops were, um, w was opened and no longer isolated, it caused um, a pressure transient, which ended up also causing a fitter, a fault detection, um, to trip uh, and, um, and, and cause one loop to go offline temporarily. Uh, again, there was no issue. Again, it was also one of these cases where the, the problem was identified very quickly. Uh, looking back at previous tests uh, and, and DM2, the previous mission, it was something that was seen before, uh, but not enough such that it tripped off any sort of limit. So, so again, it was identified very quickly. Uh, the team was all over it and I was able to fix it very quickly. So uh, no issues whatsoever right now with, with thermal control. But I think both of those are examples of how you learn. You know, they're, they're, you learn how your system operates while you're flying and kind of how to operate it in a way and how it's going to operate on orbit. So like we had mentioned in the question, was it something that you learned while you're flying? Yes, there were both things that from a system perspective are pretty normal things that you learn while you're you're starting to bring on a new system. Yeah, I, think, uh, I think it's prudent. Uh, folks have been very cautious in setting those limits, and um, so yeah, absolutely. You learn with thermal. You have convection on the ground, and you have other effects, and you can't uh, simulate all of those. So we do put in um, limits uh, which are tight, so that we can see those uh, far before they end up becoming problematic. And that was the case here. Okay, that looks like our last question. Thank you so much to our briefers and also to the reporters who stuck with us through the uh, long operations tonight. I think it was well worth the wait. It's great to have Crew Dragon at the International Space Station tonight. And just a reminder that you can um, tune back into NAS TV on Wednesday morning to see the two uh, Russian members of the space station crew um, take a spacewalk. They, uh, Sergei Ryzhikov and Sergei Kuzgerchkov will be going outside the Poisk module to do some work uh, preparing for the arrival of a new Russian research module. Uh, coverage will begin at 7.30 a.m. Central Time, and the spacewalk is expected to start at 8.30 a.m. So you want to be back on Wednesday for that. And again, thank you, and have a great night.